The Zen Environment by Marian Mountain. In popular Buddhism, samsara is sometimes likened to a process of burning, while nirvana is the process of blowing out or cooling. Zen first stirs us up. It makes us more aware of our problems and our illusions, and even creates new ones. But Zen also helps us become aware of our deepest karmic nucleus. The Buddhist vow to save all sentient beings originates in the karmic nucleus. Nirvana is the peace and calmness experienced when we reach this deep level of ourselves and accept our karma. While I had been experiencing the full fire of my karmic nucleus at Tassajara the summer before, the mountain where I found half dipper hermitage was also being swept by a fiery awakening. During the winter, the burned out hermit and the burned over mountain cooled together, and before spring, green sprouts began pushing their way through the blackened ground around the hermitage. I understand that there are certain species of plants and trees whose seeds sprout only after a fire. Our Buddha nature may be like a seed that grows in the ashes of our burned over forest of illusions. When the mountain was covered with spring wildflowers, my karma suddenly and unexpectedly encouraged me to leave the hermitage. Perhaps I was becoming too attached to it, and if I had stayed, I might have turned it into my old hometown. Even if we think we have found the source of our self, it is self-defeating, limiting, and, strictly speaking, impossible to remain at the source. I took only a few things with me, my sewing basket, an Indian blanket, a sleeping bag, a pack, and a few changes of work clothes. The rest of my personal karma I left in the care of Big Sur scavengers who live off the discarded dreams of transients. After I had gone, pack rats, friends, and neighbors picked over the bones of my old writings, my books, my personal treasures, my silence, my solitude, and my illusions until there was nothing left of what I had once called myself. Self? If you go back as I did once, you'll find only the ruins of a solitary retreat. Clouds drift freely now through the empty hair hermitage. With no home where I could settle down, there was nothing to do except settle down where there was no settling down. For weeks, I drifted around with no aims, no expectations, supported and protected only by my good karma. I slept in fields, on beaches, in backyards and occasionally in strange beds. I ate on the road and brushed my teeth in gas station restrooms. I was helped on my way by Buddhas driving sports cars, Buddhas driving pickups, Buddhas driving station wagons and Buddhas driving diesel trucks. I was treated to breakfast in San Simeon by a traveling salesman Buddha, given $5 a Topanga Canyon by a retired school teacher Buddha, propositioned by several horny Buddhas <laughs> in San Diego, fed tortillas and refried beans by a familia of Mexican Buddhas in Tecate, threatened by a crazy Buddha outside Phoenix and whisked to safety by a little old Buddha in tennis shoes. I was preached to in Provo by a Seventh-day Adventist Buddha, entertained in Reno by a banjo-playing Buddha, and spoiled in San Francisco by a hospitable Buddha. 
A Buddha, one of my Dharma sisters in Carmel, told me that Suzuki Roshi was recuperating from a serious illness. He was at Tazahara. He had it had been over a year since I saw Roshi, and I had met and we had met for a heart to heart talk. So the next morning after breakfast with my Dharma sister, I hitchhiked to mon- to the monastery. The Buddha who opened the door of Suzuki Roshi's room didn't look as ill as I had been led to expect. We greeted each other warmly, and Roshi invited me in. Since this was an unusual occasion, he said that we should first bow to each other. In the past, whenever I come to Roshi's room for formal instruction, the disciple had bowed to the Zen master. This time, Buddha bowed to Buddha. Three times, our foreheads touched the floor. Then, we knelt at a low table and were served cups of hot green tea by Roshi's attendant. Neither of us felt moved to speak. It was Roshi who finally broke the silence. I looked out of my window the day before yesterday, he said, pointing to the small, sliding, paper-covered window behind his low desk, and I saw you. Day before yesterday, I had been in San Francisco with no intention of going to Tessahara. But then I said to myself, Roshi continued, No, that can't be Marion. That girl is too young. He smiled at me and his eyes twinkled mischievously. But now I see that it was you that I saw through my window. I told Roshi how glad I was that he looked so well. He said that Japanese men often have their biggest health problems around this age. And if they recover from this critical period, they live an unusually long and healthy life. We both agreed that Roshi was on the road to recovery and would live to a ripe old age. Roshi asked about my own life. I told him that I wasn't practicing Zazen at the moment and I didn't expect to return to formal Zen training, but that I was happy. I said that I was planning to go back to Big Sur because I felt that it was the right environment for me. I told him that since I left Tessahara, I had discovered that ordinary people, people who knew nothing about Buddhism, had a lot to teach me about Zen. Roshi listened intently, nodding his head now and then. You are much more humble than when I last saw you, he said. So the life you are living must be good for you. I can see that you are healthy and happy, and that is all that matters to me. Suzuki Roshi had poured much time and attention into my Zen training. He had hoped that I would wear the Buddhist robes and devote my life to teaching Zen Buddhism. But he let go of my life effortlessly, just as effortlessly as he would let go of his own life a few months later. Neither of us knew then that it would be the last time that we were to meet face to face in this life.